Well, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. It's a pleasure and also a big responsibility. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Laura Ken for having come um, such a long way from the United States to here to Porto just to give this talk. Uh, honestly, when we invited Dr. Laura Ken for this special day, we were not expecting you to accept. Because, okay, Porto is an interesting city, but we were in the middle of a pandemic and coming such a long way to Porto just to give a talk. The in the first Porto One Health Day, it would be really something for us, but you have accepted. And I think this tells a lot about, sorry, I'm going to remove the mask. I think this tells a lot about uh, the commitment of Dr. Lara Khan to the um, One Health issue. I've known many people who are very committed, but not all very committed people would do what Dr. Lara Khan has done. I've written a few notes so that I don't forget any important aspect of the curriculum of Dr. Larican. But I think that instead of reading the notes, I'm going just to mention a few things that come to my mind. Um, and one of them is that, well, I've known, we all know, people who are visionaries. But some visionary people cannot witness that they are right in their lifetime. And uh, Laura Khan is fortunate because she's witnessing now that she was right 20 years ago. And this concept of One Health is becoming more and more important, not just because of the COVID pandemic that we were, and we are still living, but also because of other issues like environment. And uh, going through the internet, I found a very important information about how things started. Laura Khan, sorry for treating you like this without saying Dr. Laura Khan, in 2005 organized a conference um, in which she um, brought this idea that we have to um, consider health not, not just from the side of the humans, but also from the side of the animals and the side of the environment. So we all have organized conferences, but not all conferences have given rise to such an important movement that, like the One Health movement. And the One Health initiative was initiated by Laura Kahn and by others. And um, it's so important that now we are here talking about this concept of One Health with one of the co-founders of the initiative, that the only thing I can hope for is that this will not be the last day of Porto One Health, but just the first of many One Health days that we are going to celebrate in Porto. So we have listened to very interesting talks here all day, and many of them have raised this important issue of how can we combine different aspects of health. And as scientists, we are aware of that, but I don't know if all 
lay people are aware of the same. And I don't know, to say the least, if politicians are aware of the importance of this concept. So I believe that our role as scientists is going to be in the future to make politicians more aware of the importance of relating health in its various facets. And I believe that the experience of Laura Kahn will help us a lot in bringing awareness of the public and of decision makers as well. So Laura, thank you very much for being here with us and letting us know how you have dealt in the United States and in the world also with this issue. And uh, thank you once again for being with us. Uh, Abracada. I'd like to thank you for inviting me um, the invitation was easy to accept because I wanted to come visit Portugal for many years. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today with you to give you a One Health analysis of food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance, and climate change in the 21st century. And yes, they are all related, and I will show you how. First, I have to try and get the slide. What's that? Ah. So uh, it's important to recognize that agriculture is the foundation of civilization and climate change threatens agriculture and food security. Antimicrobials are the foundation of modern medicine and antimicrobial resistance threatens antimicrobial use and food safety. And together we need both if we want to have a modern advanced society. Just a few definitions. When I say food security, I mean no hunger. Food safety means no foodborne illness. And for the purposes of this talk, when I say antimicrobial resistance, I'm focusing strictly on bacteria, although you can have, of course, resistance by viruses and fungi. So the One Health concept, you've heard in previous talks about the concept. It's from my perspective, very simply, that human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. And so then this concept provides a very useful framework for examining and addressing the complex issues that we will talk about today. And if we want to develop effective policies to address these issues, we need to look at the root causes. And I think it's very important for all of us to remember that we interact every day with our environment by inhaling air, by drinking water and other fluids, and by ingesting the plants and animals that we call food. And this is the One Health Initiative website that my colleagues and I run. Please visit it. So you can uh, use, uh, to illustrate the framework, um, I use a multidimensional One Health matrix, or more accurately, a tensor. A tensor is a multidimensional uh, unit, uh, but I'm going to use the word matrix. And here I'm going to use a Rubik's cube. On one dimension of the matrix, I have the One Health factors, the humans, the animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems. On another dimension, the complexity factors, which provides a sense of scale, the microbial or cellular, the individual and the population, 
And then the third dimension, political, social, and economic factors, and we've heard some of these factors in the previous talks that are so important in driving human behavior, and they can be represented by political borders, local, regional, national, and international, global. And I'm not representing the fourth dimension, which can be time, uh, which can be either days, months, years, or whatever time frame you wish to use. Now to represent this framework in two dimensions, I use it this way, um, but I want to point out that for this talk, I'm defining environments by the abiotic or the soil, water, air aspects of defined geographic areas and ecosystems by the biotic interactions, microbial flora and fauna within geographic areas. And so by using this framework, then you can um, use it to examine an issue in a very concise, systematic, and comprehensive way. So for this talk, I'm going to provide you with a One Health analysis using One Health factors along one dimension. The complexity factors, I'm going to skip the individual level, uh, focusing on microbial populations, fecal microbes, and then uh, ending with the political, social, and economic factors focusing on the global demand for meat. So in other words, I'm going to be giving you a satellite perspective of these issues on planet Earth uh, using the One Health framework. So our first analysis is going to focus on humans and domesticated animals at the global level. We have now almost 8 billion humans, and according to the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, we have around 30 billion terrestrial food animals. Humans and their domesticated livestock now constitute about 96 to 98 percent of the global terrestrial mammalian biomass. There's actually very little wildlife left. Broiler chickens are a sign of a reconfigured biosphere and the combined mass of broiler chickens now exceeds all other birds on Earth with a standing population of almost 23 billion. And as the famous children's book author Taro Gomi writes, all animals eat and so everyone poops. And indeed, according to this study by David Berendis and colleagues published in Nature Sustainability in 2018, we produce around 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter each year. Animals produce about 80% of it. Or to put that into perspective, in 2014, 4 trillion kilograms would fill over 1.6 million Olympic-sized swimming pools, or to put it another way, bury the entire surface areas of Los Angeles and New York in six feet of feces. That's a lot of feces. These are big cities. I know I, live, I, lived in, I lived in this one and I now live in this one. A lot of feces. And we produce increasing amounts of fecal matter each year. So if we focus just on the human fecal matter, which is about 20% of the 4 trillion kilograms, we have over 670 million people still defecating outdoors. And many people don't have access to basic sanitation that we take for granted. Much of the people without access to basic sanitation live in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and South America. Now, if we look at animal fecal matter, the information is much murkier. And I found this global assessment of manure management policies and practices. This is a study done in the Netherlands. They looked at 34 countries to see what they're doing, if anything. 30 countries did have policies, but they found very few countries actually have enforcement mechanisms to enforce the policies that they passed to deal with animal fecal matter. And I think it's important to recognize that the sanitation systems that we have that process human fecal matter only process human fecal matter. They're not processing 
the uh, 80% of that 4 trillion kilograms that the animals are producing. Now, we think about this problem as being one of developing countries, poor countries, but actually it's a big problem in developed countries as well. In the United States, we have what are called concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, CAFOs where we raise hundreds or thousands of animals in tight, uh, enclosed quarters. And the most recent study that I could find or paper examining this was in September 2008 in a US uh, report. They found that no federal agency collected consistent, reliable data on these CAFOs, but they did find that some large op operations can produce more than 1.6 million tons of animal fecal matter per year, more than some uh, produced by large US cities. Now, there are of course many pathogens in human fecal matter that I've highlighted here. I'm not going to read them off to you. But there's also uh, many pathogens in animal fecal matter as well that I've highlighted here that you may or may not be able to read. But it's important to note that there are relatively few studies that actually examine the impact of these pathogens in animal feces on human health. Uh, now in 2015, the World Health Organization released a report estimating the global burden of foodborne illnesses. And they found that about one in 10 people are sickened by food each year. Uh, 600 million people get sick, around 420,000 die, and 40% of the cases are children under five. And they found that uh, of the different 31 foodborne hazards, diarrheal disease agents cause the most illnesses, around 550 million, 230,000 deaths. And if you look at the uh, the pathogens, well, lo and behold, they are in animal fecal matter and human fecal matter. So now let me switch gears. Now keep that thought in mind. And now let me switch gears and talk about plants, because I think it's important to recognize that without plants, none of us would be here. And both humans and animals rely on plants for food. So the world has over 50,000 edible plants, but just three of them, uh, rice, maize, and wheat, provide 60% of the world's food energy intake. And for plants to be healthy, they require a number of elements. Uh, well, they require light, carbon dioxide, water, and soil, but they also require these macronutrients. So, um, the Green Revolution uh, refers to, uh, well, Dr. Norman Borlaug was a plant pathologist. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his work on averting widespread famine. In 1944, he, was, he worked for the Rockefeller Foundation and was sent to Mexico to help them develop wheat varieties that were resistant to disease. Um, so he developed a wheat variety that had high yield um, and then adapted these uh, varieties from Mexico to Asia and to South America. And this process was known as the Green Revolution. And the results of the Green Revolution were really quite striking because um, you can see the cereal production just took off even though it was with the same amount of land. And that's really important because we only have so much arable land on the planet, but if you can increase your uh, production and your yield, that uh, can feed a lot of people. Uh, and so you can see in 2018, the cereal yield, particularly in the US and in uh, China uh, and other countries uh, have, have been really extraordinary. But as with the good comes, unfortunately, the bad, and there were problems with the Green Revolution. Uh, soil erosion requires a lot of water, of course, if you're going to uh, grow crops that intensively. And you also are relying on uh, fertilizers. Um, you would 
uh, result in micronutrient deficiencies, and so they relied on um, high nitrogen fertilizers to provide the crops with the uh, nutrients that they need. They also used genetically engineered crops, also known as genetically modified organisms or GMOs, which uh, has led to a lot of widespread political opposition. So tying it back now with the manure issue that I mentioned in the previous analysis, back in 1961, most of the manure being used was, or most of the fertilizer being used was manure. Uh, but now, uh, in 2019, most of the fertilizer being used is synthetic fertilizer. So we used more times, 1.5 times more manure than fertilizer in 61, and in 2019, four times more synthetic fertilizer than manure. So the question is, well, if manure is not being used as fertilizer, then what's being done with it? Uh, and the other question is, well, manure does provide some important uh, nutrients for plants, including important organic matter. So there are beneficial uses of manure. So that then brings me to the third One Health analysis, looking at environments and ecosystems. So climate change threatens agriculture, and agriculture unfortunately worsens climate change. And to truly understand climate change, we need to look at the geologic timeline of the temperature of the planet. Now, sure, during the Paleozoic era, millions of years ago, the planet was very hot. There was lots of life in the seas, but the land was barren. And over time, the planet began to cool. Uh, and then you get into the Pleistocene, which is when the Ice Age occurred. Now, early hominids appeared around here. Now, inexplicably, the planet began to cool around here. This is the Holocene era. We live in the Holocene era now. But what's so striking about the Holocene era is agriculture developed right about there. So for the entire duration then of civilization, the, the temperature of the planet has been on this Holocene baseline. This Holocene baseline has provided us with relatively mild, predictable, stable climate allowing agriculture to exist and allowing civilization to develop. Now, there have been a few little blips uh, off this baseline, most notably the Little Ice Age. That was a small deviation below the Holocene baseline. We are now about one degree above the Holocene baseline, and we are starting to see the effects of climate change. Also, I highly recommend this book, Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Save the World, written by a geologist. It's an uh, excellent read. The artists at the time, during the Little Ice Age, documented for us what it looked like. The Little Ice Age existed from around 1300 to 1850, and they documented frozen wastelands. There were, the Thames would freeze over, uh, in Britain, you had ice skating in Rotterdam and uh, in Flanders, uh, frozen wasteland. Most notably, though, the I Little Ice Age was noted for crop failures, bread riots, famine, and wars. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the Little Ice Age, this is a very thick book, Global Crisis. A thinner book, Nature's Mutiny, written by Philippe Blum. The interesting thing I found about nature's mutiny was he found a correlation, of course that doesn't mean causation, he found a correlation between uh, severe weather events and crop failure and witch burning. So somebody had to be blamed for the bad weather and it was usually poor elderly women who were uh, accused of cavorting with the devil causing the famine. So they were punished. Uh, during the Little Ice Age. So, uh, so you can see then that um, poor weather 
uh, affects crops and then affects civil society. So uh, don't think that uh, these things cannot happen uh, in the 21st century. So in 2010, the World Bank did some mathematical modeling to estimate the agricultural yields in 2050 due to climate change effects, uh, estimate, uh, assuming that current agricultural practices and crop varieties remain the same. And they found, they determined that much of the planet is going to become too hot and too dry to grow food with uh, substantial reductions in percent yields. There are a few uh, beneficiaries, uh, notably the uh, most northernmost countries, although that's assuming that the uh, soil in the uh, Siberia and in the Arctic are fertile to become the new breadbaskets of the world. Uh, as it is right now, in 20, well, this was in 2020, there are a lot of countries that uh, are food insecure, where there are many hungry people, including the United States. This is a monolithic blue, but I can assure you there are very many hungry people in the United States as well. So now, getting back to this issue of manure, um, unfortunately, manure, as well as synthetic fertilizers, emit some of the most potent greenhouse gases around. They are major sources of methane and nitrous oxide. So methane is 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide in trapping heat, and nitrous oxide is 265 times more potent than carbon dioxide in trapping heat. So uh, just very quickly, coal is essentially decomposed plants. Uh, so giant plants decomposed, over millions of years they are compressed, uh, and then uh, heat and pressure turned these dead plants into coal, so we burn that. Uh, similarly with oil, uh, sea creatures and plants died, buried under, uh, so, uh, under the uh, silt and sand. Millions of years, pressure turns them into oil and gas. So when we're burning, coal and oil and gas, we're basically burning decomposed plants and animals back into the atmosphere. So in 2017, according to the US EPA, the US methane emissions, 9% of methane emissions comes from manure management, 27% uh, comes from enteric fermentation, also known as cow burps. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about cow burping today, but that's a huge contribution of methane. Nitrous oxide, which again is 265 times more potent, is 5% is from manure, and a whopping 74% is from agricultural management, which means the tilling of soil and the application of high nitrogen fertilizers that aerosolizes into the atmosphere. So major contributions of agriculture to climate change, unfortunately. Let me switch now to ecosystems, talking about the global resistome. So it turns out that antimicrobial resistance is ancient and it's everywhere. We don't know what goes on below the soil, but um, what scientists very cleverly did was they uh, developed a practice called metagenomics, where they extract DNA directly from the soil. And when they did that, and they looked around the world, they found antimicrobial resistance genes to many antibiotics. Um, and so they called it then the global resistome. So we live in a microbial world, we have to remember that. So this antimicrobial resistance is not a new thing. This is something that exists naturally in nature. So now how are we adversely impacting the global resistome? Well, through indiscriminate antibiotic use in humans and animals and in crop agriculture, poor sanitation, untreated human and animal waste that is left on the soil and they interact then with the soil microbes. They contaminate the land and the water 
uh, leading to foodborne and waterborne illnesses. And then uh, wildlife can spread these resistant microbes and genes around the world. Now, so these two studies are very interesting, and um, I wanted to just briefly talk about them. Uh, this study that was done um, looking at global antibiotic consumption from 2000 to 2010, they looked at pharmaceutical sales data. And when I read this paper, the uh, surprising thing about it is that Australia and New Zealand have some of the highest antibiotic use per capita. And I thought, why Australia and New Zealand? I mean, those are two really wealthy countries. Why would they have such high antibiotic use per person? Well, then this paper that I mentioned earlier, estimating the global recoverable human and animal fecal mass, interestingly enough, Australia and New Zealand, of course, they have a lot more sheep than people. They also have some of the highest ratios of animal to human fecal matter produced. And so my question then is, is there a relationship? Is there a relationship if you've got a lot of animal fecal matter contaminating your environment and your waterways, making people sick, does that lead to then increased antibiotic use? And that's a pure speculation on my part, but again, it's an issue that I think warrants study of the role of animal fecal matter in the environment since we've got a lot of it and it's just basically being ignored uh, both in terms of human health, uh, the environment, and uh, our global ecosystems. Um, this paper I thought was very interesting, published in Veterinary Sciences, manure as a potential hotspot for antimicrobial antibiotic resistance dissemination. So not only does it contaminate the soils, but it can also serve as a hotspot in and of itself of increasing resistance. So that then brings me now to my fourth one Health analysis, the most challenging, if you will, the political, social, and economic factors, as you heard from the previous speaker, it's virtually impossible to get people to change uh, their, their dietary preferences, much less their culture. Um, and so food security, as I said, is the foundation of civilization. Food security means no hungry people, and it's built on three pillars, food availability, food access or affordability, and food use. And food security is so important that the United Nations uh, listed it as number two of its sustainable development goals, zero hunger. There are, of course, political implications of food insecurity, as I mentioned uh, when I spoke about climate change. When you see food prices spike, that leads to civil unrest. When food becomes unavailable, people riot and civil society breaks down. So meat consumption is very high in a number of countries, most notably the United States, um, Argentina, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, these are some of the highest meat consuming countries per world, in, uh, per person in the world. Now there are of course pros and cons to eating meat. It, provides a lot of important micronutrients, such as vitamin B12 and iron. There's evidence that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat. And of course, eating meat is an integral part of many religions and cultures. But of course, there's some cons. The meat's not essential if you supplement. Uh, it increases zoonotic spillover risks, as we've seen, as we've heard from the previous two talks. Uh, eating meat, of course, increases the risk of uh, acquiring zoonotic pathogens. And raising domesticated animals or hunting wild animals can contaminate environments with wastes, reduces biodiversity, and can disrupt ecosystems. So global meat production, as, as you saw in the previous slide that I showed, cereal yield had increased. Well, uh, meat production has increased as well. And these animals are being fed with a lot of the cereals that are being grown. Um, and eating meat is almost the norm everywhere. In every country you look at, most people eat meat. There's one exception, that's India. India has the largest fraction of vegetarians in the world, and that's largely because of Hinduism, their religion. Uh, 
dictates that they be vegetarian. But even there in India, there's a growing demand for animal proteins and uh, particularly dairy products. It is possible to change cultural preferences, uh, but it's not easy. Um, in the United States, more Americans are cutting back on meat consumption. Um, the reasons include concern about their health and about their environment. But again, it's very, very hard to do on a large scale, much less on an individual level. So to sum up then our One Health analysis findings, um, humans and their domesticated animal populations are growing and producing increasing amounts of fecal matter each year. Animals produce 80% of it, but we generally ignore the animal fecal matter and quite honestly don't know what's being done with it at this point. Um, they contain, both human and animal fecal matter contain many pathogens, but sanitation systems are only designed to handle human waste. There's little oversight of manure management in many countries, including in the United States. Plants need uh, these nutrients, including nitrogen, uh, which are contained in manure, but synthetic fertilizer use, including high, high nitrogen synthetic fertilizer predominates. Unfortunately, manure management and uh, the agricultural soil emit very potent greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide, which is worsening climate change. And the large amounts of manure are contaminating our, the global ecosystem, the global resistome, which then worsens antimicrobial resistance. And in some, then, all these findings impact food safety and the practice of medicine and food security and the continuation of agriculture. So you might be asking, well, what can be done? Well, uh, in 2016, the United Nations General Assembly met in New York to talk about antimicrobial resistance, and they agreed that a One Health approach is important, uh, and one of their objectives is to improve sanitation but they made no mention anywhere of the importance of manure management and the uh, impact that manure has on ecosystems. So that's a major oversight. And as a result, none of the national action plans include any uh, mention of manure. Uh, similarly, uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement, and I think it's important to uh, mention that uh, the countries are meeting in Glasgow as we speak to deliberate again on uh, climate, uh, climate uh, targets to try to not go any more above the Holocene baseline than 1.5 degrees. The further you get away from that Holocene baseline, the worse it's going to be for agriculture. There's no mention of curtailing agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions in the Paris Climate Agreement, and I don't know if they're going to be talking about it at all uh, in Glasgow uh, this, this week. So there are strategies to reduce methane and nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, manure management, you can change the way it's stored. You can capture the methane with digesters and convert it into renewable energy. And with agricultural soil management, you can use low nitrogen fertilizer, drip irrigation, and use cover crops and not uh, tilling this or turning over the soil. I tried to see if there were any countries or states that passed legislation on trying to curtail agriculture's contribution to greenhouse gases. And the only entity I could find was the state of California. They passed this bill uh, short-lived climate pollutant strategies uh, where they um, reduce dairy methane emissions by 40% using these um, uh, dairy, dairy digester uh, uh, programs um, to try and convert methane and use it as an energy source. That was the only uh, political entity that I could find that had any kind of... Uh, mention of agriculture, and it was just on dairy farms. It wasn't on crop, crop uh, tilling or anything else, and not on CAFOs either. So to sum up then, uh, we need to restore our beautiful planet. One Health recognizes that life on Earth is interconnected. We live 
in a microbial world. Our bodies are mostly microbial. We need to recognize that and we need to figure out how to live more sustainably on this planet. This, our matrix then analysis has revealed the microbial connections between food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance and climate change. So what must we do? Well, I applaud you all here uh, in Porto for holding this One Health Day event, and I hope you have many more. Uh, One Health education, research, policy development, and outreach are all extremely important if we want to ensure a sustainable future for both our individual health as well as for our civilization. I just want to briefly mention I have a free online Coursera course, Fats, Ducks, and Pandemics, an introduction to One Health policy. There's over 5,000 uh, students enrolled from around the world. Uh, please visit it and uh, tell your colleagues to check it out as well. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues with the One Health Initiative. Um, again, this website is a labor of love for us. We get no payment for it. Um, we are dedicated to spreading the word about One Health. And with that, uh, abragada. I'd like to thank you all and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for this uh, very um, forward-looking um, perspective and also for bringing issues which uh, we normally don't uh, talk about. There's a message from uh, Central University of, of Ecuador congratulating us for this day. So I would like to send mm. our regards to our friends in the University of Ecuador in Quito. I don't have any questions in the chat, but I have a question from Adriano. Please, Adriano. Oh, there's a oh, and the cloud as well. Actually, it's not that the question. Microphone. Quick, quick question on that. What about the pig, <laughs> pig manure? <laughs> what happened to that? Laura, um, a fascinating, uh, incredible angle to look at this problem and to see it. I had a question about the antibiotic resistance. So you see a connection, and I was looking at the map, and I saw that the connection was not only to Australia and New Zealand, but it was also to Argentina mm -hmm. and partly to Brazil, which are heavy meat producers. But my question has to do with something that you mentioned. You said that to some extent antibiotic resistance may be natural. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether that is really the case because what in fact happens in, in a lot of these countries is that they use tons of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. 
to raise the cows or the animals. So, so to, to what extent do you think that there is a connection there in terms of um, animal waste? And the, has anybody tested and looked as if this antibiotic resistance is actually related to the use of the antibiotics in animals? Yeah, thank you for your question. Well, they actually tested the soil in the Arctic, Arctic permafrost that dated back millions of years and in Antarctic areas that neither place ever saw human anthropogenic exposure of antibiotics or animal waste. So these antimicrobial resistance genes were in places that had not been exposed to human or animal waste at all. And these resistant genes were there. So that then suggests that these, um, that these resistance genes are naturally occurring. That it's not just in, they tested the soil around the world, not just in, in places where there were human ha habitation. Laura, thank you for your presentation, which was very nice. And I have one question related to food safety, because that's when, uh, one of the priorities, at least here in Europe and for the consumers. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about use of, of manure and why you don't use manure to fertilize the soils, mm -hmm. and we are using artificial fertilizers, mm -hmm. uh, very recently we had a problem in Europe because of organic uh, farming mm -hmm. and organic plantations. And in fact, we had a very serious problem because of organic fertilizers right. and contaminations because of that. And in fact, when we use manure, that can be a source of contamination. Yes, so exactly. I'm not sure how, how safe that can be or how can we control the transmission of zoonosis through that manure. Yes. So maybe that's the reason why uh, in uh, intensive production, uh, people prefer the use of uh, artificial uh, fertilizers. Yes, and thank you, you make a very good point. And yes, the, the uh, animal manure can serve as a source of pathogens on crops and water. Um, it, it can't be raw, it has to be processed. You have to remove the pathogens before you can use it as, for, before you would wanna use it as fertilizer. Uh, so it can be, uh, the process can include uh, composting, for example, heating, heating the waste before applying it to crops. And heating means energy. Well, putting it in the sunlight, uh, that, might, uh, that might suffice. So, I mean, I think it war warrants further study uh, because it does provide organic, uh, it, it has organic, not just the microbes, of course, which you want to take care of, but it has these organic properties, uh, the roughage um, that helps to provide nourishment to the soil. So it's a careful line to tread between controlling for food, for food safety purposes, but providing the soil with the nourishment, the crops with the nourishment that you need in order to grow uh, help, you know, healthy, uh, to get good yields. So yes, I, I understand you know, your concern, um, which, is, which might, one be, might be a reason why they did use high nitrogen fertilizer, but unfortunately it's a significant source of nitrous oxide and, and that just can't continue. Um, Laura, thanks very much for your presentation. It was a very, uh, food for thought and uh, challenging uh, in many ways. Um, my question is regarding the contribution of uh, agriculture to gr the greenhouse emissions uh, globally. Uh, we, we know that the EP EPCC uh, studies the recently in 2017 or 19, even 19, the, for the agriculture specifically, yeah. um, it was found that uh, on average, uh, agriculture and uh, uh, related uh, products from, from agriculture would contribute uh, with about uh, 20, 23% of the global uh, greenhouse emissions. 
However, um, my, my impression is that uh, when we look uh, at the globe, we have a big heterogeneity, big diversity at regional level in, into this average. For instance, in Europe, uh, we know that uh, our contribution is 10%. Our, the, the, our, the, the, uh, our agriculture contributes to which 10%. And in fact, uh, the Green Deal, uh, which the um, Commission launched, um, is, is a very interesting political initiative because it, it, ten, it wants to, to change, to transform the, the, the emission profile. And 50% and of our investment, it will be in transforming the energy sourcing. So uh, moving from, uh, from um, uh, organic and, and uh, non-renewable energies to renewable energies, then transportation and uh, house uh, warming and uh, refreshing. These are, these are the three main uh, sectors which uh, in Europe they contribute uh, with, uh, uh, with the greenhouse emissions with about 70% or so. But my question uh, relates with this. Uh, this plan uh, is about the three uh, trillion euros investment in eight years. So it, it, it's a huge amount of, of money uh, for 6% uh, of the people around the globe. Uh, and, and, and really, uh, I, I, this is a challenging issue. I would like to have a comment from your side because it, it really, the, the political and economical issues you mentioned, uh, they may, may be drivers, uh, very important drivers on the issue. Yeah, no, thank you for your question. Uh, absolutely. Look, uh, food security is the number uh, two UN sustainable development goal. And number one is uh, to end poverty. So poverty, food security, those go in together. And of course, each country is going to have its own unique uh, challenges in terms of its need to feed the people and provide them with the basic essentials for a, a decent life. Um, so we need to figure out how to balance the needs to, for food security, for agriculture, without worsening uh, climate change. I mean, I think there can be some technological solutions, uh, but I don't see the great effort being made to do that uh, as much as we need to do. Uh, there's like uh, drip agriculture. You know, there are, there are things that can be done to help to reduce the contributions of nitrous oxide, for example, from agriculture. And I, and I think, uh, you know, the wealthier countries can certainly help some of the poorer countries in uh, ensuring that, and, and I don't think their contributions are going to be as large as some of the other countries, uh, the United States, for example, to have uh, larger uh, emissions. Uh, one of the side effects, again, of using the hydrogen fertilizers. So there's no simple answer to this. Um, and each country is going to have its own unique need. But we need to figure out how to ensure food security uh, without getting too high above that Holocene baseline. So it's going to have to be a, a we don't want to get beyond, I mean, the goal right now is to not get above 1.5 degrees above that Holocene baseline. That's going to be very challenging to do. Hi, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, a lot for your presentation and coming such a long way to talk to us. And most importantly, I would like to thank your effort, effort for the One Health initiative, as I believe it is the only way to go. So with that in mind, uh, in my personal perspective, and this is more the perspective of the veterinary med medicine, but I do believe it is the same in the different fields, is that the One Health approach is gr growing each year and more and more people want to get involved. But instead of building bridges among the different fields, we are building another field of people that are that see it all together and want to work it all together. And so I don't know if this is a local issue or a global issue. And I would like to ask you if it is global or lo local. And either way, what do you think can be done to change it and to build the bridges that can really join the efforts? Oh, thank you for your excellent question. Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, Yes, um, 
that's there. I think there's a tendency for people to like to create their own little silos, but the whole goal of One Health is to break those silos. So I think each and every one of us can play up an important part to reach out to your colleague in a different field. If you're in human medicine, reach out to your veterinarian colleagues. And if you're in a veterinarian, reach out to your human medicine colleagues. And certainly having events like this, where people from the different disciplines can get together and hopefully network and get to know each other. Um, you know, everybody's kind of in their own uh, separate section of the, of the uh, university trying to build those bridges takes effort, but each one of us has a role to play. So thank you for your, for your question. Thank you, Laura. It's, I'm here. Uh, if you can come uh, every Wednesday, if, <laughs> in second months, we will have more medical doctors here for sure. But, uh, and, and that's the point. Uh, uh, when we talk about this, and the, 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 the big issue in, in medical, for medical doctors is antimicrobial resistance. Okay, they know, we know what we have to do, prescribing less, mm -hmm. diagnosing better, and so on. But I think the majority do not care about what, what take uh, to, this, uh, the, to this point, except the, 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 the facts in, in, inside the hospital. So, but besides the microbial resistance, how do you see what should be the role of a medical doctor in this one else uh, concept? Oh, thank you so much for that question. Well, I think one of the challenges that we face is we are working against nature in what we are doing, and we need to start working with nature if we want to be more sustainable. I think of antibiotics in a way kind of like fossil fuels. They've been relatively cheap and very easy to use, and they've been very effective. But they come with sizable costs, including antimicrobial resistance, which is becoming increasingly worse, threatening the entire practice of modern medicine. Um, I've been a big proponent of so, so the natural, and I have a whole talk on antimicrobial resistance, but the natural foe of bacteria are bacteriophages. These are tiny viruses. They are the most prevalent bioform on the planet. Uh, they are the natural foes of bacteria. And the entire bacterial uh, immune system, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, is designed to counteract bacteriophages. Um, now, Having said that, though, there's a lot of challenges with using them because they're very specific, and using a phage to treat a bacterial illness uh, is akin to personalized cancer treatment. You have to tailor the, the bacteriophage exactly to the infection. That has its pros and cons. Now, one of the uh, deleterious effects of antibiotics is that they kill off the good with the bad bacteria. So it alters your microbiome. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, and there's this great book called Missing Microbes by Martin Blazer, talking about how some of our widespread use of antibiotics has led to um, uh, foodborne illnesses or uh, food, uh, food allergies obesity, certain cancers, chronic diseases can be, a, he's shown that there is some credible data that antibiotic use has led to these problems. So it's, it not only impacts uh, individual health, but the, um, the, the, the biome, the global resistance of the planet is being adversely affected by our reliance on antibiotics. So there's a green energy format in the form of pages but we're decades away, just as we were decades away with green energy, solar and wind uh, to try to counter the use of fossil fuels, I think we have, you know, we should aspire to develop the green antimicrobial version of that to have a more sustainable use uh, of, of antimicrobials in the future for the practice of modern medicine. They can either serve as adjuncts or as substitutes, but we have to get off antibiotics the way we have to get off 
uh, the uh, green, the uh, fossil fuels. I, I see a great parallel there between them. So we need to start thinking outside the box. Um, there was, um, it's becoming increasingly um, common now to use fecal transplants uh, for people with Clostridium difficile infections. They were actually developed by veterinarians 100 years ago. A horse with diarrhea, they would hook it a, a tube up between the two rectums of one healthy horse and one sick horse and let the healthy, the, the <laughs> feces from one horse go into the sick horse and it was cured. There was some interest in medicine but in the 50s, but because of the ick factor, it never got anywhere. But with worsening antimicrobial resistance, we're now seeing these fecal banks uh, you know, feces, lots of research being done on some of the therapeutic uses of fecal transplants, including they find people with obesity uh, have a different microbiome, it appears, than those who are thin. So there's, there's all sorts of things, I think, that we can, as we are learning in microbiome research that um, can help us, I think, overcome this hurdle. But I think we are kind of at a crossroads where we have to really start thinking more microbially uh, than uh, what we have been doing. So thanks for that question. Well, thank you. Um, Director of was, um, Professor Eric Steven is going to close this session. But before that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Laura Kahn again. And just to um, highlight two very important points that you just uh, brought up during the discussion. One is, uh, get together, discuss among yourselves from different disciplines, the various perspectives that are involved in One Health. And the other important lesson that I think you have transmitted here is work with nature, don't work against nature. Thank That's you very right. much, Laura. Thank you, my pleasure.